Prime Minister's questions should be interesting today. Rishi Sunak uh, really needs to deal with the Hester issues, and I'm not sure he's going to. I think he's going to try to suggest that Hester has apologized and that's enough. He's going to keep the money because the money has almost certainly been spent, particularly if there's even the slightest possibility that there will be an election in May. That money has already been earmarked, if not actively spent. Let's see what he's got to say. Now come to questions to Prime Minister Amsul Khan. Question number one. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the post office IT scandal is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history, and I'm determined that the victims get the justice and redress that they deserve. Today, we're introducing legislation to quash convictions resulting from this scandal. The Department for Business and Trade will be responsible for the new redress scheme, and we're widening access to the optional £75,000 payment. Hundreds of innocent sub-postmasters have fought long and hard for justice. With this bill, we will deliver it. Yeah. Meetings with ministerial colleagues and others, in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Abdul Khan. Yeah. Mr Speaker, despite serious opposition from the Archbishop of Canterbury, three former Home Secretaries and three Government Ministers advisers on anti-Semitism, social cohesion and on political violence, the levelling up sector is due to widen the definition of extremism tomorrow. Whilst on the benches opposite, members peddle far-right conspiracy theories about Islamists and Muslims taking over Britain. Shouldn't the Prime Minister's priority be getting his own house in order and stepping out extremism, racism and Islamophobia from within his Conservative Party? And will the Prime Minister finally take Islamophobia seriously and agree to that definition? Minister. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, discrimination has no place in our society. And it's important to distinguish it's important to distinguish between strongly felt political debate on one hand and unacceptable acts of abuse intimidation and violence on the other i would urge him to wait for the details of the strategy it's a sensitive matter but it's one that we must tackle because there has been a rise in extremists who are trying to hijack our democracy that must be confronted and he talks about peddling conspiracy theories i would just point him in the direction of his previous labor candidate in rochdale yeah. uh, thank you mr speaker armed forces personnel who serve their country for 15, uh, 15 years are eligible for the Long Service Good Conduct Medal, and similar medals are in place for those who make a career of serving in the police, the fire, the ambulance service, and the Coast Guard. But as I learnt on a recent visit to Bournemouth Hospital, where I met the dedicated staff there, no such accolade is in place for the NHS. Would the Prime Minister please support my campaign to see if this anomaly can be corrected, so the nation can formally recognise those who devote much of their working lives in the NHS to helping others. Yeah. Prime Minister. My uh, honourable friend is right that our incredible NHS staff deserve our utmost thanks for their service. And I'm pleased that many NHS organisations, as he knows, have their own schemes in place to do that. We also, of course, recognise NHS staff who are outstanding through our honours system, and MPs are able to acknowledge their work through the NHS Parliamentary Awards, and nominations remain open for that, and I would encourage colleagues uh, to avail themselves of it. But I will make sure that he gets to meet the Secretary of State to discuss his specific proposals further. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Stam. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the legislation on the Post Office scandal? Mr Speaker, this week we lost the formidable Tommy McAvoy. He served his hometown of Rutherglen and the Labour government with loyalty and good humour, and we send our deepest sympathies to his wife, Eleanor, and their family. We also learned that the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead will be taking her well-deserved retirement. She has served this House and her constituents with a real sense of duty, and her unwavering commitment to ending modern slavery is commended by all of us. We thank her for her service. Is the Prime Minister proud to be bankrolled by someone using racist and misogynist language when he says the member for Hackney North and Stoke Newington makes you want to hate all black women? 
Minister. Mr. Speaker, the alleged comments were wrong. They were racist, and he has now, as I said, the comments were wrong. They were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse and that remorse should be accepted, Mr. Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. Mr Speaker, the man bankroll and the Prime Minister also said that the member for Hackney North should be shot. How low would he have to sink? What racist, woman-hating threat of violence would he have to make before the Prime Minister plucked up the courage to hand back the £10 million that he's taken from him? Mr Speaker, as I said, the gentleman apologised genuinely for his comments, and that remorse should be accepted. But he talks about language. He, he might want to reflect on the double standards of his deputy leader, of his deputy leader calling her opponent scum, Mr. Speaker. His shadow, his shadow, his shadow foreign secretary, the shadow foreign secretary, comparing conservatives to Nazis, Mr. Speaker, and the man that he wanted to make chancellor. The man that he wanted to make Chancellor talking about lynching a female minister. His silence on that speaks volumes. Mr Speaker, the difference is he's scared of his party. I've changed my party. I think the the argument that he puts forward that this is all about language is wrong. I think there's a big difference between calling somebody scum, which is a perfectly reasonable <laughs> expression, I think, um, calling somebody scum and calling for people to be shot. It's that issue, quite apart from the racism, which is central to the Hester uh, commentary. And I, I don't think it can be wiped away with, a, with, with, with an apology by hearsay. Uh, wheel him onto the television. Let's hear him actually apologise. Let's hear him grovel. Uh, let's see him stick on a chicken suit and um, and, 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 and gobble. But uh, uh, I, I think I'm referring to a to a TV program on Netflix there. Um, but uh, it, it, it's it's not enough. A, hear, a hearsay apology is not enough, and the prime minister should not be accepting. He should not be keeping the money. I want to hear both the Prime Minister and leave the opposition. Here's one. Two weeks ago, the Prime Minister invited himself into everyone's living room at six o'clock on a Friday evening. No one asked him to give that speech. He chose to do it. He chose to anoint himself as the great healer and pose as some kind of unifier. But when the man bankrolling his election says the member for Hackney North should be shot, he suddenly finds himself tongue-tied, shrinking in sophistry, hoping he can deflect for long enough that we'll all go away. What does the Prime Minister think it was about the hundreds of millions of pounds of NHS contracts given to Frank Hester by his government that first attracted him to giving £10 million to the Tory party in the first place? I, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the new Keir Starmer. The uh, shrinking in sophistry, the Mrs. Merton reference, really good. But have you noticed how lame and mute is Lindsay Hoyle? Lindsay Hoyle is barely capable of managing to utter a put-down. He's barely capable of raising his voice. For the last two weeks, he's done nothing. He's just sat there looking sulky. Uh, the former Prime Minister, Ted Heath, was uh, a significantly more uh, adroit and voluble sulker than Lindsay Hoyle. Lindsay Hoyle just thinks he can keep his mouth shut and somehow or other struggle to the end of this parliament. I think he should be offering his resignation and getting out because he's no longer capable of doing the job. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm absolutely not going to take any lectures from somebody... From somebody 
am somebody who chose to represent an anti-Semitic terrorist group, Hizbut Tahrir, who chose to serve a leader who let anti-Semitism run rife in this Labour Party. Those are his actions, those are his values, and that's how he should be judged. Mr Speaker, the problem is he's describing a Labour Party that no longer exists. I'm describing, I'm describing a man who is bankrolling their upcoming general election. Um, Keir Starmer. They, they can shout all they like. Two weeks ago, he marched them out like fools to defend Islamophobia, and now the member for Ashfield is warming up the opposition benches for them. And yesterday, yesterday he sent them out to play down racism and misogyny until he was forced to change course. He won't hand the money back. He won't comment on how convenient it is that a man handed huge NHS contracts by his government is now his party's biggest donor. You have to wonder what the point is of a Prime Minister who can't lead and a party that can't govern. And Mr Speaker, national insurance contributions fund state pensions and the NHS. So is the Prime Minister's latest unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance going to be paid for by cuts to state pensions or cuts to the NHS? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, it's, I'm glad he's brought up the budget. It's about time that he spoke about his plans. Because what have we heard, Mr. Speaker, from the Shadow Chief Secretary, the Shadow Chief Secretary of the Treasury, confirmed? Sure. Shh, Prime Minister. The Shadow Chief Secretary of the Treasury has confirmed that the Labour Party will not be sticking to the Conservative government spending plans. So we now have a litany a litany of unfunded promises on the NHS, on mental health, on dentistry, on breakfast clubs, and that doesn't even include the £28 billion 2030 eco pledge that he's still committed to. But what we all know, Mr Speaker, is that while we're cutting taxes, Labour's unfunded promises mean higher taxes for working Britain. No, Mr Speaker, the Labour Party will not be sticking to his completely unfunded £46 billion <laughs> promise. But he thinks he can, he can trick people into believing that, but simply shaking the Tory magic money tree will bring it into existence. No, no, let, let, let's be clear. 80% of national insurance is spent on social security and pensions. 20% is spent on the NHS. So he's either cutting pensions or the NHS or he will have to raise other taxes or borrowing. Which is it, Prime Minister? Mr Speaker, I know, I know it's not a strong point, but if you actually listen to the Chancellor last week, what he would have seen is NHS spending is going up, Mr Speaker. It's going up. It's a plan that's backed by the NHS CEO, who says that we're giving her what she needs, and at the same time, we are responsibly cutting taxes for millions of people in work. An average worker benefiting from a £900 tax cut, Mr Speaker. But what I'm hearing from him is he's against our plans to cut national insurance. The highest tax burden since the Second World War. I did listen to the Chancellor. £46 billion of unfunded commitments. They tried that under the last administration and everybody else is paying the price. But two weeks ago, the Prime Minister promised to crack down on those spreading hate. Today, he shrunk at the first challenge. Yeah. Last week, he promised fantasy tax cuts. Now, he's pretending it can all be paid for with no impact on pensions or the NHS. All we need now, Mr Speaker, is an especially hardy lettuce, and it could be 2022 <laughs> all over again. Is it any wonder that he's too scared to call an election yeah. when the public can see that the only way to protect their country, their pension and their NHS from the madness of this Tory party yeah. is by voting Labour? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, again... No, no Prime Minister. Mr Speaker. He talks about pensions. Pensions are going up by around £900 in this year. It's this government that's protected the triple lock for the last 10 years. He talks about supporting working people. It's this government that's cutting taxes for every single person in work, Mr Speaker. It's this government that's investing in the NHS. But all we have from him 
Our, all we have from him is a £28 billion unfunded promise. Mr Speaker, I had a look at it. I had a look at it. It's here. It's all here. Making Britain a clean energy superpower. He's still stuck to it, Mr Speaker. And if you look through it carefully, there's billions in spending he's already committed to Scotland, billions for Wales. There's actually money for North London too, I notice. But the problem is, the problem is... The problem is, none of it is funded. So why doesn't he come clean and tell him under his plans, Britain people's taxes are going up, Mr Speaker? Mr Speaker, millions of people around the UK and Europe have been inspired by the brilliance of Six Nations rugby. And Premier League clubs like Gloucester Rugby which were funded during the pandemic through loans authorised by the Prime Minister as then-Chancellor, have always been grateful for being kept solvent. But the Prime Minister will also know that the finances of some of these clubs are fragile and that the current loan repayment schemes could be crippling. So will my right hon. Friend ask the Sports Minister and the Treasury to try and find a solution through this so that taxpayer interests are protected and all of us can go on being inspired by top-class rugby for years to come? Mr Minister. Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right that we stepped in with a £150 million financial lifeline to ensure the survival of Premiership Rugby League clubs during the pandemic. And I am told that DCMS is working with Sport England as the agent to talk to borrowers with concerns about their loan agreements and any ones that do have concerns should contact Sport England in the normal way. But I can also proudly tell him that we are talking to the Rugby Football Union and the Premiership League to secure not just the future of Rugby Union, but also his local Gloucester Rugby. Yeah. We come to the leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I wish to begin by wishing Ramadan Mubarak to Muslims across these aisles. Mr Speaker, the Conservative Party have accepted a £10 million donation from an individual who has said that one of our parliamentary colleagues in this chamber should be shot. Why is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom putting money before morals? Mr Speaker, as I said, the comments were wrong. The gentleman in question has apologised for them, and that remorse should be accepted. Stephen Flynn. This is complete rubbish. The gentleman in question apologised for being rude. He wasn't rude. He was racist. He was odious. And he was downright bloody dangerous. Now, on Monday, the number 10 said, we've seen an unacceptable rise in extremist activity, which is seeking to divide our society and hijack our democratic institutions. Isn't extremism that we should all be worried about? The, the views of those Tory donors that we have read about this week. Yeah. Prime Minister. No, Mr Speaker, there has actually been a rise in extremist activity that is seeking to hijack our democratic institutions. Yeah. It's important, it is important, it is important that we have the tools to tackle this threat. That's what the extremes and strategy will do, and I would urge him to wait for the community secretary to release the details. So it falls to the leader of the SNP to bring the subject back to the real issue, which is that a person who is funding the Conservative Party has called for a member of the House of Commons to be shot. It doesn't matter whether it was made in jest, in anger, or uh, or, 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 that, or, or that he now recognises the language was incautious. He's had five years to reflect on the stupidity of his language, and he's been quiet in that five years, and meanwhile been paying money to the Conservative Party. What is this, blood money, bribery, hush money? No, it's unacceptable. That money should be paid back. This man should be excoriated. This man should be made, should be paraded through the press to apologise in public. And even then... Nobody should be accepting his money. It's unacceptable. And it doesn't matter who he's talking about. This is a member of the House of Commons. And uh, the, the least that Rishi Sunak should have done is to have had Diane Abbott publicly into, the, in, into number 10 to personally and, uh, and publicly apologise to her on behalf of the lame Hester who hasn't come out in front of the press and apologised publicly. This is so shocking. 
so shocking. Anyway, I'll bring you more stuff during the day. I've got to run off and teach.